Uh, good afternoon um, and welcome everybody to this term's last lunch hour lecture, uh, which is enti entitled um, Can Big Data Attack Heart Disease? Um, the lecturer today is um, Professor Harry Hemingway, uh, who is, um, whose first degrees were at Cambridge and he's been at UC um, a good time. Um, is now the um, director of the Far Institute of Health Informatics, um, which is a wonderful institute, um, which will take forward all the information that we can give about health in order to improve outcomes. And um, Professor Harry Hemingway. Thank you very much. So let's start with the answer to the question. The answer is yes, uh, big data can uh, help to uh, attack heart disease. Uh, but I think, as I'm going to outline in my lecture, there's a challenge to us in society to work out how many people we want to uh, let die prematurely from preventable disease, let suffer needlessly uh, from preventable disease because we haven't gone uh, far enough, uh, fast enough in this area. So I make no apologies for... Um, uh, a simple outline. Um, I'm going to say something about what big data are. Um, I'm going to give nine areas where I think there are initial advances using big data in heart disease and briefly uh, talk about uh, what we as a society need to do next. Diseases of the circulation affect the head, the heart, the belly and legs, a related set of diseases. These are common. Uh, they cause a profound impact on quality of life and symptoms and, of course, are commonly uh, fatal. In the world, uh, cardiovascular diseases uh, account for an increasing number of, of deaths in the world, the most common cause of preventable deaths, premature death, uh, and that is projected to remain so until 2030. So there are some numbers for you. Um, to show that cardiovascular disease is more common than uh, cancer uh, and, and other forms of disease across the world. This is no longer a set of diseases confined to rich countries. So what do we do with cardiovascular diseases? What are the current models? In very broad terms, we do two things. One is we try and prevent these diseases. God forbid any of you is eating something with a kind of high saturated Con uh, fat content for your lunch. I notice nobody's smoking. That would be kind of close to illegal. Um, so smoking, blood pressure, and cholesterol, these are the things that we might do uh, to prevent cardiovascular diseases. And where prevention fails, we have rescue. We have acute emergency medicine to look after people who've had a heart attack, who develop heart failure, uh, and so on. But m nearly all of what we know about how to prevent and treat heart disease, how to keep people healthy, and indeed not just for heart disease but for other heart uh, diseases, comes from an era of inquiry where data were essentially small, simple, expensive, hard to collect, and private, not shared. That's a bold statement. So the question is, uh, What's the contrast? You know, what are big data and what might big data offer us in a campaign to uh, reduce, mitigate the burden of this important set of diseases? So across society, you know whether you're in public sector or private sector, whether you're in no sector whatsoever, you're a citizen, uh, there is uh, a fantastical interest in uh, big data. One definition of what big data are concerns the four Vs, the volume. There are a lot of data points, a lot of people, a lot of variables on a lot of people. By a lot, millions, trillions, certainly the data sets that we have at the moment have, you know, I haven't counted them, billions and trillions of data points. But that's not enough. In addition, the data are diverse, the variety of data. So when you link up data from different parts of the healthcare system, for example, the third V is veracity. A key feature of big data is that we uh, cannot control 
the truth of the data, the quality of the data, uh, we have to deal with messy data, with noisy data. And lastly, velocity. The, the financial global system would, of course, collapse if we weren't able to uh, transmit data at fractions of a second of speed. And, of course, that's got implications in healthcare as well. So if we bear these uh, broad concepts in mind, um, we can see that in those slides that I said, there are computers and machines. So in the primary care setting, in the preventive setting, in this country, one of the country's crown jewels is that uh, general practice has been computerized for some decades. Uh, you'll notice that the blood pressure here is being recorded by a digital device. Um, you'll see that on the right-hand side, there are a number of machines that are recording data. Data about the condition of the patient, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the temperature. Data about the, uh, the administration of, of, of drugs and so on. So you see that putting those two forms of data begins to build up a picture. I hope you can see that those are big. Uh, but you'll notice there's a question mark there. I'll come back to that question mark. Now, clearly, we uh, are individuals and we live in a, a, a set of concentric circles in, in some senses. We have our own genetics and behavior. We may have our own families. Uh, we live in communities and societies and there's a, a, a broader environment. And we know that all of these levels uh, have an impact on health and disease and cardiovascular diseases in particular. So we may... Uh, be interested in data at multiple levels uh, in society. Drilling down within the individual, we have now a spectacular ability to characterize an individual's molecular makeup. So we are now able to do whole genome sequencing. There are some 20,000 genes uh, in, in, in humans. Um, we're able to measure in hundreds of thousands of people, i.e. at large scale, the proteins that those genes encode and go on to look at anatomical and functional consequences with a widening array of imaging modalities and how those relate to the some 15,000 diseases that we currently recognize. Not all of which are cardiovascular, of course. So the combinations are enormous. The point is we have these data, we've measured this, uh, we could talk about this 10 years ago, but we didn't have the data or the ability to measure it in large populations. So putting this all together, you can quickly see that we have an emerging uh, tapestry of data. And I think the word tapestry is a helpful word. Uh, it's not very neat. Uh, a tapestry of data that we may be interested in uh, getting at in order to do better uh, with heart disease. If I just briefly highlight a couple of features in this slide. So here in the rows are things that uh, you might say, well, let's find out what we've got on these kinds of data. You know, what do we know about um, you know, the diagnoses that people have, the encounters and so on, the genetics I've mentioned, all sorts of different things right through to the environment. So these are from the individual through to the family through to the environment. And you'll see that there's both structured data i.e. data that you can get at easily, coded data, data that would look kind of recognizable to a, a conventional researcher, whoops, and unstructured data. Uh, here, so for example, uh, free text. It is still the case that in, in primary care in uh, the UK and many other countries, um, people write things. Uh, some people say that that's natural language, but then other people say, well, the language that uh, doctors use is, is quite a long way from being natural. The point is, it, it's free text. So you'll see on this slide that this includes uh, social media and, uh, and a broad range of data sources. So all these data sources exist. Uh, some of those data sources, as I will show, are particularly uh, rich and special in the UK. Um, and today I'm going to focus mainly on these structured data that arise from healthcare records. So, why did I put that question mark on this slide? The answer is that it's a surprise and arguably a scandal that not just in this country but in many countries uh, we are not able 
to do that simple addition. We're not able to get at the data uh, within hospitals. Data, data everywhere, but not a drop to drink. In one hospital, there may be 200 or 300 different electronic health record systems. So that means that the modern practice of medicine in many countries around the world, many hospitals around the world, not all, uh, is essentially divorced from data. An analogy might be if we are unable to say in a given hospital who are the patients that go in, what care do they receive, what outcomes might they expect to experience one month or a year down the line. If we're unable to answer those questions, an analogy might be would you get on an aeroplane in which the instruments and weather reports uh, made little use of, of modern computing? I suspect the answer is that you would not be happy to do that. So, that's a little bit about uh, big data in, in, in principle. What can we do today? What have we been doing today at the Fire Institute? Well, the first point is the UK is special. It is, remains, largely free at the point of use. It has a unique health identifier, your National Health Service number. That's very useful. What is even more important is that nearly every citizen is registered with a general practitioner. Not only that, that people go to their general practitioner, even fit young men, apparently. And, and every general practice uh, does use an electronic health record. So that's a terrific place on which to start because you can link the primary care record with other record sources. So here's an example of some linkages that we've been doing. So the top left corner is these primary care record data, and that is essentially anything that a GP could say, so diagnoses, values, and so on. But that's not the complete picture. So we link that with the hospital episode statistics, which is just simple uh, disease and procedure data. We linked it with one national registry, myocardial infarction, that's one technical term, that means heart attack. Uh, there's a registry of all the uh, heart attacks uh, in the hospital, which gives you more details about the heart attack, and on to the national death record. And why have we done that? We want to link these diverse record sources to get high volume data in order to build up a longitudinal picture of a patient, a person's experience. So you'll see that uh, at birth, you're registered with your GP and you're going to die. And things happen in between. And some of those things are captured in primary care. Some of those things are captured in the hospital data. Some of those things are captured in these disease registries and some are captured in the death record. So there's about 2 million adults in this particular uh, data set. Do the data mean anything? The veracity question. You know, do we pass go? Are we interested? Well, let's take a very simple relationship. Your resting blood pressure today, here, has been shown in many expensive studies uh, collected over the previous few decades to be strongly related to your subsequent risk of heart attack. So we would expect to see higher blood pressures having higher um, hazard, uh, relative risks uh, for heart attack over time compared with a sort of baseline value here of a, that's actually a very, very respectable blood pressure. So that's what we'd expect to see, linear relationship there. What do we actually see? Well, I played a slight kind of trick on you there, because the first slide and the second slide both come from these noisy, diverse data, blood pressures not collected in research conditions, but collected by your general practitioners. And they do show, at this scale, strong signal. So the veracity uh, question is, uh, at this scale, uh, not a concern for these types of questions, i.e. the data, good. And what value do we get from linking up data? Uh, we get uh, great value from uh, being able to link the death registry data, uh, the disease registry data, the hospital admission data, and the primary care data to be able to count the frequency of heart attack in the population. And what does this cost the research funder to collect all this data? Well, it's an exact figure. It costs the research funder to collect these data nothing because they're collected as part of clinical care. So, what do we want to use these data for? 
The first thing that I think we want to use these data for is to provide a new way for you, me, citizens to engage with our health and health care. Online ownership of data is control, and that's important, and here's a real example of where you can edit, look at your entire medical record uh, in a hospital. Not just the record, but also things that patients want to monitor themselves, Fitbits, things on your smartphone, uh, eye health and so on, a whole range of things that maybe your GP doesn't record, uh, but you can and you may regard as really important. Even more than that, citizens doing their own science. This is an example from cancer, but this is a real teenager who's got out publicly available data and developed a, a clever computational approach to early diagnosis of leukemia. So it's not just the academics that can do the science. And why is all this really important? This is important because we need to build a consensus over legitimate, important concerns about privacy, privatization, and other things in accessing these data for research, balance that uh, with the potential benefits uh, in terms of, of, of health. And how do we make, strike that balance? We need to strike that very carefully. Uh, we need safe people, safe data, and safe systems. We need to be clear and communicate with the public about what the data have been used for, where they've gone, and we need to uh, involve the public in that process. So Hippocrates would say, first do no harm. So how awful is it when a new drug, Vioxx, turns out to have a side effect of uh, causing heart attacks? So that's bad enough, but these things do happen. What is uh, potentially worse is that thousands of people probably died here needlessly, in the sense that if electronic health records had been mined in an ongoing way to pick up this safety signal, that warning could have happened one or two years earlier. That's of profound importance. We first do no harm, we all care about safety. Assuming we get safe treatment, we want to get better care, the right drugs at the right time, for example. So here is an example in people who have cardiovascular disease. These drugs, statins, which uh, lower the um, bad cholesterol in, in your heart, are supposed to be taken lifelong. And here you see that after a heart attack in these years, there's a gradual decline in the people on these drugs. People are drifting off these drugs. So here the electronic health records are both identifying the problem and because you can put decision support into the electronic health records, there's a, a potential area for uh, what a solution might be. Earlier diagnosis. Of course, uh, whether it's cancer or cardiovascular disease, uh, we are interested in whether we could get to the root of the problem sooner because we may be able to uh, offer more effective treatments. So here's an example, again from these same uh, linked electronic health record data. These are all people who've had a heart attack and this looks back at the rate of chest pain consultations. I go to my uh, doctor with uh, chest pain but she or he does not give me a diagnosis and then I go on to have a heart attack. So there's an increase in chest pain consultations prior to a heart attack. Is that an opportunity uh, for other things to have been done with these patients that could have maybe prevented that heart attack? You, hard to get at without these kinds of uh, large-scale data. And of course, not only earlier diagnosis, but the right diagnostic labels. The one thing I can be sure of is that the things we call diseases today will be called different things in five and ten years' time. So here's uh, time along the bottom axis. This is percentage dead in the vertical axis. And these are different types of heart attack. So you see heart attack unspecified, that's in the middle here, but the a uh, rather odd name of non-ST elevation heart attack. Now, I was always brought up to say, don't say what something isn't. 
Uh, whatever that thing is, it's doing rather badly. You don't want to have one of those. So the challenge, again, with the electronic health records is, is there other information here that could help us dissect what that disease is and tell us what it really is? We are individuals. We have our own individual characteristics. And we, of course, have an interest in knowing what are the benefits and harms for me or people like me. And there is a considerable value in using these big data to combine multiple pieces of clinical information in order to uh, identify uh, people at different risk. This needs uh, computers. This needs computers, potentially in the clinic. Uh, the analogy, which I think is a reasonable one, is uh, you can't do your tax return, well, I guess most of you can't do your tax return uh, in your head, so how could you expect a clinician to combine more than one or two pieces of very simple information in order to say whether you are very likely to have an adverse event or not. So here is an example. So this is uh, predicting whether I am more likely to benefit from a treatment. That's the broad question. So this is taking simple clinical information, so blood values, history, age and sex, those kinds of things. Information that a clinician would record and would be familiar with. And putting that together in a statistical model to identify groups at very widely differing risks of cardiovascular death. So this high risk group uh, has got something like a, uh, in excess of a 60% risk over five years in this population. Hugely different from the low risk groups. Now if I'm a patient in this setting, I'd quite like to know which group I'm in. That may absolutely guide my decision on whether to take a drug uh, with known efficacy but also a known side effect profile particularly if that side effect profile is serious, like bleeding, which may be bleeding in the head, which is something that people don't want to have. So this is important for clinical decision support tools. It's important for patient counselling. There's no reason why these data, these tools, can't be publicly available and the onus of making decisions uh, shifts somewhat from, uh, if you like, um, benevolent paternalism of old-fashioned clinical uh, decision-making to one of, of a more joint approach between the doctor and their patient. Of course we want better outcomes. Uh, that, in a way, you could say maybe that's the trump card. Isn't that really what we care most about? I think to some extent it is. Uh, but better than what? That's the key question. So you will have heard politicians, you will have heard scientists say that this health system, this hospital, is doing better over time. Okay, so what that says is good for California, if you're in California. Good for England, if you're in England. Is that really what you care about? Actually, that's a secular trend, pretty much. You study most cancers, you study most cardiovascular diseases, stuff gets better. That's good, that's, that's good. But is it good enough? Is that... Um, a poverty of ambition. I don't think it is good enough. I think one has to look at some more challenging comparators. So you might ask the question better than another system that you think might be doing really pretty well. So here's another example where uh, large data can help. So what are these data before I um, tell you what the answers are? So this is about half a million people total with, with heart attack, drawn from the UK and Sweden, the only two countries to have ongoing national disease registries uh, in uh, heart attack patients. Very simple data, so this is zero, is the date of admission, 30 days, most people will be discharged if they're alive around about day three, four or five from hospital, uh, and this is simply the percentage dead. There is a large difference between the UK and Sweden. Now that difference uh, in these data could not be explained by differences in patient characteristics or indeed actually in differences in measured treatments, not wholly explained. But I think this comparison is important 
Because if we want our elected representatives to stand up and say things like uh, we want the NHS to deliver you know, the world's best health care, you have to pull that down to empirical observations. This is not the world's best health care. These are not the world's best outcomes. So what would the situation be in the US? So in the US, uh, there is no national registry for heart attack. You don't have quite comparable data. Uh, there's some great uh, health systems, plural, within the US. But you can imagine, because of the funding system, that there may be uh, some less than alacrity in saying, this is what my system provides in terms of outcomes, this is what my systems provide in terms of outcomes, for reasons uh, that I think should be obvious. We need new drugs. The existing drugs are good, uh, but they are not uh, good enough. So you're all familiar with Moore's law, more transistors per processor over time. You may be less familiar with this cheekily titled palindrome, uh, Erum's law, which is how many new drugs do we bring to market per billion of investment? Uh, back in the 1950s, a large number of new drugs. Now, we don't even get one new drug uh, per billion of R&D investment. It's a challenge. So the question is, uh, can we use a range of big data uh, resources to help fix that uh, somewhat broken uh, drug discovery, delivery, trial pipeline? So a couple of places where that might work. So one is uh, using genomic data, uh, genomic data linked to electronic health records. And electronic health records, as I hope I've shown you, help us decide you know, who's got disease. You know, in, you know, in school biology terms, genetics is about the, the, you know, the genotype and phenotype, right? And here we're interested in uh, phenotypes and diseases that we um, might be able to get drug targets for. So, we have, uh, in the UK, uh, a, a rapidly growing amount of genomic data linked to electronic health record data. So, for example, um, already existing is probably the world's largest uh, cohort study, 500,000 people, with a very ambitious uh, imaging program uh, and linked to genomics uh, data. It's a, an, a, an astounding resource because this data are open to the scientific community at close to zero cost. Astounding resource. In the health and biomedical terms, uh, that is uh, uh, an uncommon situation. Genomics England is uh, sequencing 100,000 patients with cancer infections and rare diseases, including cardiac diseases, linked to the electronic health record. And this gives opportunities for discovery of new diagnostics, new therapeutics, uh, validation uh, with genomic approaches of, of drug targets. The records also allow us to say, well, where should we be pointing our efforts? You know, where do we need new drugs? So, if you were a pedant, uh, you would look at the word blood pressure control and think, is that right? So, you mean, you can give drugs to get people's blood pressure down to a normal value, but then they still go on and get lots of cardiovascular diseases. Is that really what we mean by control? You know, if you said that to a patient, they'd think that somehow the risk has been mitigated. So in these kinds of data, we can show really that is profoundly not true. So these are people, um, again, from electronic health record data, so these are people with hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, and these are overall, if you look at the bottom row here, this is the total life years lost um, free from cardiovascular disease. So it's about five years of life lost that you'll have because of having hypertension, despite a whole array of modern drugs. So where we want to get to is this being close, you know, brought down to here. So this says there's, there's target to go at. And these data up here says, well, what are the particular diseases that are taking uh, healthy life years away from people today? So 
So let's take an example close to home, close to people uh, watching this, uh, your own resting heart rate. You can measure it right now. Uh, you may have a device uh, that can measure it. Um, and you may even be wondering, um, if I measure that, what, what's normal? What, what on earth is he going to show me next? Well, good news and bad news. So the bad news is uh, your resting heart rate, which, let's face it, is about the most accessible biomarker, physiological biomarker we have, uh, is pretty strongly related to nasty things, coronary death, heart failure, sudden cardiac death, at values that, uh, although there are no published values of what normal is, most of you in this room will be somewhere around here. So that's, uh, that's probably of interest. Um, it's a specific effect, though. Uh, so this is all on sort of no effect here, the heart attack risk and the ischemic stroke risk. Um, and that's got implications for, given that we have drugs that specifically lower heart rate and we have behavioral interventions, take more exercise, um, we could see that this could uh, feed through uh, into the design of trials, uh, screening, uh, and other things. So, the health records might help design trials, the so-called prequel, you know, carry out trials. Here's an example here where a whole trial was done in the context of an electronic health record and then followed up. Here's an example where uh, electronic health records were used to follow up and then afterwards in the implementation of trial results. We may care, I think we should care, uh, about advances that would lead to lower costs in the healthcare system. And here's an example. Uh, actually, there are cardiovascular examples in this, uh, in this same paper where having access to quality registries is uh, demonstrating quality improvements uh, can be shown to uh, be associated um, with, with lower costs. And lastly, of course, and in some ways I could have equally well started here, uh, we want better public health. There are certain things for most, well, many cardiovascular diseases uh, that are in the realm of public health. Uh, so the public smoking ban is one great example. Uh, when that legislation came in overnight, there's a natural experiment. Uh, and this elegant paper using these kinds of data is able to say is that important piece of public policy that you may have agreed or disagreed with beforehand, um, does that have uh, health benefits? And the answer is yes, but it's great to be able to demonstrate that. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up now and just say a few brief words about how we're we going to uh, move forward uh, on this. So I think to go further I've given you some tasters, I've given you some starters, I've given you some examples where I think this could be interesting. Um, we've got to uh, think about different ways of doing science. So to some important extent, we need to move beyond this era where uh, data are small and simple and expensive and private, not shared, to the opposite uh, of all those things and embrace those opportunities. Uh, our politicians, our elected representatives in this uh, and, and other countries are really important here. Every single one of those individuals has made speeches in this space. Big data, health. In fact, I will quote from this individual who said, um, the UK, he said this in his science speech at the Royal Society, the UK has the world's best and most complete healthcare data in the world. And that's two superlatives in one sentence. Uh, so that's quite impressive. Um, in parenthesis, he also is in the public record of having said, the worst job I ever had in my life was as an NHS coder, which he had as a, as a student. So he looked at healthcare records and he also thought it was pretty bad. So, so these uh, political uh, leaders are really important and how we in the run-up to the general election in, in, in this country, uh, how they position the UK here is going to matter. Uh, across the world, new partnerships are absolutely being developed between uh, hospitals, universities, and a range of industries. So this happens to be UCLH, uh, this is University College London, and this is uh, the proposed uh, 
Google headquarters um, in King's Cross as an example of a potential industry partner. So what is the FAR Institute? So the FAR Institute is new, uh, established uh, by investment from 10 uh, health and related research funders. Uh, it spans 21 universities in, in four centers. It's got a threefold mission. One is to do research with these types of emerging data. Secondly is to teach and train short courses, masters, PhD programs. And thirdly, to engage in the public NHS and industry partnerships, which are essential to drive this forward. Who was far? He was uh, a UCL alumnus. Uh, he was one of the original big data people, I guess, of the 19th century. Uh, and he gave us a classification of diseases. So, to conclude, can big data uh, attack heart disease? I think the answer is yes. But I think the rate of advance is importantly a question of our emerging relation between data and society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think we have time just for maybe one or two questions. Do we? Yes, over here. Uh, yes, this lady. There's a mic coming down. Um, sort of two questions. One is, um, eating of meat, does that make you more prone to heart attacks? And the second is, um, in the newspaper it said that certain statins were much better than others, but when you ask a doctor, they'll say, oh, we can't give the better ones because they're more costly. Do you think there's any difference with them? So the meat question, I don't know the answer. The, the meat question is, how would you use big data to get at that question? So clearly, uh, there are huge amounts of data about uh, all sorts of different meat consumption available in uh, Tesco's and other kind of food retailers. That is potential with public consensus under due governance, potentially linkable to health records. You might be able to design experiments where you could give a better answer to that question. In terms of the differences in statins, uh, I'm not sure that that's a, a kind of big data question. That's more a question for pharmaceutical marketing companies. Thank you. Yes, we have a question over here. Uh, what should be done to ensure sh shared semantics in big data, health data? Would you like to use the mic? Oh, sorry. Uh, what should be done to ensure shared semantics in big health data to avoid things like the embarrassment of uh, the strokes in Walsall Hospital affair? So, uh, everything and nothing. So, you know, the, the, the everything is that if you can't uh, share between healthcare providers for clinical care data that has the same meaning and understand that, you, you haven't moved on, so it's really important for clinical care. The nothing answer is for some specific research questions, it doesn't matter, and it's tough to do. So there's a question of what is good and doable, tractable now that somewhat um, acknowledges that there remain uh, semantic interoperability differences. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we do have to stop now as it's 5-2, but I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking Professor Hemingway in the usual way. Thank you.